Okay, here we are, another Saturday break fast. Yes. We didn't come up with a name for this series, but we'll just call it Saturday break fast. Breakfast related. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's um, let's get to what everyone's asking. Okay. Uh, you have an ESP32. Yeah, we actually got a, a bunch of these. What is an ESP32? And, and, and what's an ESP? Not 32. 80, 80, 82, 66, 86, 22. Yeah. What are all those? So cute. Yeah, I know. Doing electronics. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the, the board we currently have. This is a um, Feather 8266. This is part of our Feather series. And in it, it's got a little module. Yeah. And, it's uh, a Feather Huzzah. Yeah. And Huzzah because it's Wi Fi. Yeah, I'm trying to get it to so there you go. Um, so it's got this it's module. Not it's not a face. It I know, doesn't it's not do feather recognition yet. <laughs> yet. Um, so it's a uh, all-in-one Wi-Fi um, chipset module that has a 32-bit Tensilica core inside of it. Runs at like 80 megahertz. Has four megabytes of flash, and you can basically program it with Arduino, MicroPython, Lua, a couple different programming languages. What's the chip that it uses? It, the chip is called the ESP8266, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's, it's What's a... What's it like? Because people know, like, AVR and stuff like that. Well, it's, it's, it uses a core called tel Tensilica, like, I think, 106, which I've actually never used. I don't, um, I don't know the Tensilica chipset. I mean, there's, there's a compiler for it. Yeah. You know, there's a port for GCC. It's, um, I don't believe it's a... People know oh, ARM and CMD. Yeah, I think I think it's not an ARM. You don't actually don't know that much about the Tensilka. The thing is, it's interesting about the Espressive chipset. There's not a lot of documentation, <laughs> so it's you know there, there's like this. I, they release like a, a compilable set of examples and you know some core code that lets you link into stuff like the Bluetooth and um, Wi-Fi, but. It's not like you get a data sheet the way you do with the at seventy twenty one where they're like it's relatively new. Every yeah. single address is yeah. identified. I mean, they, every bit mask is spoken. They've only been known, known in, in the U.S. market and our in our maker market for about a year. Right? Yeah, it's only about two years. Yeah, two years or so. Um, so yeah, so this is this is the popular uh, chipset, the ESP eighty two sixty six. So there's a, there's a couple of good things about it, and there's a couple of uh, downsides. So the good thing is it's extremely cheap. Okay. The chip like itself much? is like eight yuan. It's like a dollar ten, dollar twenty. Okay. Um, you put some flash on it, twenty cents. Couple of passives antenna. Basically, you can the bill of materials to add it to your design. Maybe like two bucks. It's not. It might not even be the most expensive thing on a board design now. Yeah, your 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 um, you know the USB to serial converter chip might yeah. be more expensive. That's an FTDI chip is two bucks. And that only does USB to serial. This is like a full Wi-Fi. So the Internet core. of Things plus your microcontroller might be cheaper than mm -hmm. the USB. It's very interesting. I mean, like that, I think that's the disruptive part about this chip, right? It's extremely low cost, and it and it doesn't do everything, which is it's a, on one hand it's a constraint, but on the other hand, people have worked around it. For example, there is an analog digital converter, but there's only one. It's not multiplexed. So there's only one pin you can use. I mean, most chips only have one ADC, but it's multiplexed. It reminds me of the constraints with uh, Arduino. Like, it worked out well because there was less you can do, not more yeah. you can do. So you have to be more creative. Yeah, this has fewer pins, less peripherals than Arduino. It does have I2S, but I think the I2S is also on the serial pins. Um, it doesn't do native USB. I don't even think it does native I2S or SPI. It, in either case, I don't believe those were released, and so it, it's a bit banged. What you can do, I mean, with 80 megahertz chipset, it's a uh, three volt, which is fine. Apparently, it's five volt compliant, um, so that's that's all nice and good. Uh, the bootloader is a little interesting. It's a ROM bootloader, and you kind of have to twiddle some pins to, to strap it into the right. This is the ESP8266. Yeah, we're still talking about the old one. <coughs> so, so the so yeah. the downsides of it was only one analog digital converter, um, not a lot of hardware peripherals, or if there are. It's like they are not accessible or they're already used for something else. Like I think the SPI is, is there is hardware SPI, but it's used for the flash chip. Um, not a lot of pins, not a lot of pins, no DAC, um, hmm. no DMA, no, uh, uh, there's Wi-Fi, but there's like, uh, there wasn't built-in hardware encryption, so you have to okay. kind of like manually do a lot of encryption stuff. Um, and, you know, a lot of things about it were not easy to find out. Okay. Kind of had to dig through example code. Gotcha. So then. But there is example code. 
there's an example code number ported to the Arduino, and I think the Arduino port is actually quite successful. Oh, there's also like a, sorry, there's only one chip, and the chip does everything, and so there's there's kind of a real time operating system. Again, I, I don't know anything about it because there's not a lot of information about this, but there's there is some real time operating system running behind the scenes that manages the Wi Fi state, and so you don't actually get a, you can't hog the processor. You have to uh, yield okay. it back to the RTOS to do Wi-Fi stuff. And if you don't, it will like crash really hard. So it's actually an issue people have a lot with this chip is they um, don't realize that they have to put in delays and yields. Yeah. So like you know normally you have to put in a request like, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna be doing some Wi-Fi stuff soon. Heads up. Yeah, but it doesn't request you have to you have to just yield every once every like, ten oh, milliseconds really? or hundred milliseconds. Yeah, you have to you have to put in the delays and so a lot of the example code that we have had does work with the ESP, but the problem is, is that we're used to working on a core where you don't have to yield. Oh, so you have to. So you have to insert delays. You have to not have anything else going on. Yeah, and you have to call yield. And at least it's just trade off. Stop. It's not a big deal if you know about it. Now, you know, so all of our examples, people have mm -hmm. committed code that adds a little delay. It doesn't affect the Arduino that much, but it makes it run on the ESP. Yeah, so it's a, the developer just has to approach the project where they need to say, stop. I'm going to do Wi-Fi stuff. Yeah. Resume. Yeah. Microcontroller stuff. And if you have a loop, you just have to keep that in mind. And yeah. like, you know, there, there are interrupts on it um, and timers and such. But yeah, it's, so it's, just, a, it's a different different approach than like Arduino. Bit, it's so. a little bit of a different beast. Um, it's, not, it's not bad. It's just a different, uh, it's just a different yeah. way of, of going at it. And so because of the constraints, a lot of projects have been um, based on the, the things that are known working, like OLEDs, known working, DHT22 sensor, known working, I2C sensor for the most part, known working, um, like some SPI displays, but there's not been a lot of uh, huge variation because there's kind of like things that work and like a lot of things that don't work and people are just like, ah, whatever, like I'll just use the thing that works. Does that make sense? It's like mm -hmm. there, there's a pool of existing um, technologies that people are aware of. Okay, so that's ESP. 8266. Yeah, so that's the intro. <clears throat> on, the, on the Twitters, people are saying, Adafruit, when are you going to featherize DSP 82, sorry, the DSP 32? <laughs> over and over, they're like, when will you featherize it? Okay. And so is, that, is that what the tweets are? That's what the tweets are. Okay. When are you going to featherize it, Lady Ada? So it's actually only yesterday we got <clears throat> some. Um, Let the featherization begin? Some dev boards of the. Uh, it really likes you. What? The camera. It's always on you. Um, this is like our house cat. I know. Leave me alone. So this is the um, the dev kit for the ESP32. It actually looks a lot like the uh, ESP8266. It's got um, uh, the uh, USB on one side, and then it's got the... Um, Wi-Fi chipset on the other. This one is in a can. This one isn't. And then um, this one has a battery charger and it's the feather size. But this is the um, the dev kit that Espresso came up with. It looks a little bit like you know the the Node um, MCU boards for the ESP8266, but um, it's kind of their own design. It has a big regulator on it. You can see under my finger there that SALT223. That's a probably 3.3 regulator. It's got a Scilab CP2102. I like the Scilabs. Um, USB serial chipset. It's got two buttons for uh, boot and um, reset. So it's like the ESP8266. You have to do a little bit of a, a pin twiddle, a dance to get it to boot into the bootloader. So instead of like jumping, instead of like you know uh, the Arduino, you um, uh, you have to uh, you know connect it like 1200 baud and then it automatically resets into the bootloader or the old Arduino where you just reset and it would just have a timeout. Um, you, you know, you it, the bootloader doesn't timeout, which I think is a little bit of a flaw. I think I think bootloaders should timeout. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a hardware wrong bootloader, so there's not much you can do about it. And um, the inside here is the actual uh, chip. So you can see there's, it's nice because it's actually decapped. So you can see in the center there's a square chip. And then um, to the side of it is the SPI flash. So that's the, there's like, you know, a couple of passives and stuff and a crystal and, um, yeah, there's like a 16, sorry, 40 megahertz crystal 
and some festival. But basically, it's just a you know the, the chip core, the SP32 and some flash. So we just got these like yesterday. Um, but you know this is it's not that far off. Like I mean, it's going to be yeah. not too hard to adapt it. I don't have any modules yet. I only have the so Z board. What's the biggest difference when you're dealing with uh, someone who's gone from Arduino? They're playing around with the ESP8266, <coughs> excuse me, 8266, um, and now they might use the ESP32. So the the thing with the ESP32 is um, it has more capabilities. It's actually more like the SAMD. It's you know it's it's, it, it's a fast processor. I think it's, it's yeah. a dual core, one runs at one sixty. So it's nice that you do have two cores. So it's kind of nice. Um, uh, inside of there, and so you you know you don't have the the issue of like yielding as well. I don't know, but I'm assuming that part of the solution for not having to yield all the time is you have two cores, one that's dedicated to handling um, the wireless. It's it's both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. Um, Bluetooth hasn't been documented or, or or there's no demo code for it yet, but apparently it does work. Um, the Wi-Fi, I think it can, you know, there's example code for SSL, TLS 1.2, so it's really nice. So it can give you secure Wi-Fi. Um, right now for the ESP32, there just isn't, there's only kind of this example code base that's been yeah. released. It, there's, there's the beginning of an Arduino port. Yeah. But it just, so we're kind of back to where we were before. We're kind of starting, but you okay. know, the, the community for these chipsets is very um, understanding and... Forgiving. I don't say forgiving, that's not that word, but they're like, they're willing to, to put in a lot of effort. Yeah. You know, so even even though they might they might have to start all over again, I think they're willing to. Yeah. Is it because the expectation is there's nothing there? So it's not like, a, it's, not like it's a big company or there's a figurehead or there's a, there's like, you can't really contact the company in the same way. No, I mean, you can't contact the company, but I think... But they're not doing, they're not doing tutorials and support or anything yet, are they? <sighs> I mean, they have, they have, they have some. I mean, there's, you know, when we got the SP31, which was the beta, you know, there was a, a sheet that kind of said how to set up the tool chain, but it's, it's kind of. Um, so a data it's, sheet. Type. It's interesting. It's like instead of having like the apps engineers in house, they're kind of, the, there's kind of this deal, and the, the, the social contract is okay. We're going to offer this chip for very low cost. I think it's like two or three dollars for the chip. Yeah. More expensive hmm. than the ESP8266, but still much cheaper than any other combination Wi-Fi. Yeah. I don't know of anything else that's anywhere close to that price. Um, like the CC3200, I think, is like you know ten dollars or something. Um, so this, you know, that they've got this deal going on, and it's kind of this. It's it's a it's a non-contractual, but it's a, it's a social contract deal where it's like, okay, we're going to release this chip. We're going to release early. We'll release it with like some code. And you know, some maybe you know, some example code showing how to like do GPIO and analytical conversion, and, and mm. maybe there's two DACs, and, and how to set up the pin muxing. What's nice is you can mux any there's peripherals, and you can mux them onto every, every pin. And in exchange, they're like, okay, you know, community, you'll do the Arduino port. Okay. And I think that it's it's an interesting deal because um, most chip companies that come to us, they kind of express that they want this deal. But they're not willing to do their half of the contract. Mm. You know, like there, there. You know, there's definitely been <clears throat> dozens of times when large, multi-billion-dollar <laughs> chip companies have come to Adafruit and are like, "Well, we want this platform to succeed," and we're like, "Okay." Oh yeah, they're, and they're like, they're, "Well, we're just going to like release it, and the community will just yeah. do it." And I'm like, "Well, you have to provide some support, and and like if you <clears throat> provide some support, you have to do something else that." Is powerful. Like for example, the TI MSP430 um, like booster pack. Like I don't, it was fairly successful, and part of their their deal was okay. We're gonna have a valve boards for four bucks. Yeah. But I don't think they released an open compiler. For, you know, they, they didn't have an open source tool chain for it. I think that, I think the open source tool chain is what EVR did. You know, that was like the strength. That's actually kind of yeah. for me the strength that people are like the Pickhead and SDCC. I know, I know, but like EVR really had. Like an open tool chain that was easy to use, that was like cross-platform, and that is what I think got Atmel and AVR so far ahead. And even to this day, they still use. I mean, now they use. Everyone uses the ARM um, GC tool, tool chain, but AVR never like made this devil pact with um, Keel or IAR. 
where they're like the exclusive compiler, the exclusive tool chain has to go through you. Like yeah. right now, if I want to do Keel 8051 uh, compilation, because like I have a project that's uh, you know built for Keel, um, it's like five thousand dollars. I think that's why uh, Embed when it started out uh, didn't take off as fast as other things because you had to use a cloud compiler. The cloud compiler was the way of getting around this. Yeah couple thousand dollar compiler I don't remember the, the name of the compiler but I remember looking it up and you know it's hard to like get them to admit it I was like well what's you know what if I want to do offline compiling like, well you can but you yeah, have to they use eventually it. they eventually had it so you can do offline compiling everything now uses the yeah. um, the AVR GCC ABI um, yeah. arm tool chain which is which is really great because <laughs> it's funny it's like I do development for all these different chipsets and and it's like I'm almost kind of like weirded out because uh, you know, I, I, I download the example code for, um, what was I working with? Um, it was the SAMD that I did, but then there was some other chipset. It was some, it was like some STM32. And um, like I downloaded it and I just like typed in make. And I'm like, whoa, like why did that compile? And I'm like, oh right. Oh no, so it was the Nordic NRF52. And I'm like, why did this compile? Oh right, I like, you know, the one tool chain that I installed like a year ago to do SAMD, it works for everything. It still works, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, they just have to, you know, they put the header files in, but yeah. you know, the, the, the tool chain is the same, which is really okay, just well, kind of cool.